Take care of your belongings. My cactus are around. I'm a Muslim woman from Anatolia. I'm a Turkish or Kurdish, maybe Armenian, maybe Roma, who knows? Ignorance is not this. You're so keen when you're mad. This is your fault. Dress more properly the next time. I'm Croatian. My best friend is Serbian. Will you call me a Chitnikusha? I'm Serbian and my best friend here is Croatian. Will you call me Ustasha? Now let me tell you about the time that I became a member of Saddam Hussein's extended family. <laughs> In 2003, the year Allied forces invaded Iraq, I was in my second year of high school. I never felt or considered myself different. I was as white as everyone else. And ashamed of my hair, I never wore it down. Yet something stood out. In religious education, where the aim is to learn difference, diversity, when the teacher left the room, a classmate sitting on the table to confront me asked me if I was a terrorist. Or perhaps he just threw the word at me. The whole class laughed. And I, unsure of what to do, and I'm willing to grasp my difference, laugh too. Laughing at myself, belittling myself, was just easier. Sometime later, in drama class, is where the title of the segment of my monologue gets its name. And it's perhaps one of my favorite, most offensive memories. Sitting on the floor with friends and chatting, our drama teacher paced over and crouched beside me. But rather than telling us off for talking, he began to ask, So, um, I was wondering, I wanted to ask, whether you're related to dot, dot, dot. At this point, his stumbling, his hesitancy, his stupidity to me was already clear. I knew what he was about to say, and yet I wasn't ready to believe he would dare say it. Well, he continued, are you related in any way to, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein? <coughs> in shock, eyes wide and mouth hanging open, a million things to tell him ran through my mind. Like how my surname Hussein is so incredibly common. Today, I would tell him that Barack Obama's middle name is Hussein. But instead, 14 and faced with an ignorant teacher many years my senior, I just said no, and he walked away. Jews only marrying other Jews is no different than Nazis attempting to create a homogeneous Aryan world. I grew up in a suburb of New York City where you were in the minority if you did not identify as Jewish. Approximately 70% of my small town is Jewish. So walking around the streets of my neighborhood, you couldn't find churches on every corner, but instead you see synagogues. Temple Kol Ami, Chabad Leibovitch, uh, Westchester Reform Temple, Temple Israel, Friends of Israel, and the list goes on. Needless to say, I grew up thinking that the world was filled with Jews and that everyone loved Jewish people. <laughs> More realistically, I never thought that anybody would not love a Jew because they were Jewish. I also never understood that being Jewish could be such a central part of my identity. Coming from a town like my own, I had no choice but to acknowledge that I was Jewish, but I never really understood what that meant. That being said, I was notoriously oblivious child. Every woman should have at least one child. To give a birth to a baby is the most important thing in female destiny. Nature will change your plans anyways. You will have sex, get married, and will give birth to a baby. Again, studying? You'd better have a baby. Why do you want to study? Women's life is to get married and get pregnant. You have to get pregnant and not fool around or think of your career. Life is purposeless without children. You have to get married and have a baby right now, while you're still a student. When you will find a job, all your male colleagues will be already married. You have to have a baby. It's through motherhood that woman is, becomes truly happy. You're not a child anymore. You have to live with everyone else, having babies. Stop fooling around. Get pregnant. <coughs> have a baby. Your husband will leave you if you want to have babies with him. Every man wants to have babies. When you will fall in love with a man, you will want to have children. When you will meet the one, you will want to get pregnant. 
Men are biologically tuned to wanting offspring. If you don't want it, you will find another woman who would want it, and you will stay alone without children, without husband. Born in 1991 in the capital city of Republic of Macedonia, in Skopje. At the age of five, my parents got divorced. That time I did not know what it means to be born and raised in a Roma single fam parent fam family. Soon I realized what it means. After my parents got divorced, we moved to another city, me and my mother. <coughs> and this city was 40 kilometers far from the capital city, in Tetolo. So we started living here, and my, my mother always had this ambition to have an ed educated kid, so she registered me in the best public school. And we had this old house next to million dollar, dollar houses. I started going to school, <coughs> the first school day, I remember it. I went to the school together with my mother, <coughs> and all the kids were with new clothes, together with, their, with both of their parents and we are waiting in the corridor when one kid was staring at me and asking something, asking something his mother. I couldn't hear what he is asking and then I entered the classroom. The first ring bell rang and this same kid was looking at me and he started shouting, she has no father, she is a bastard. I felt so angry. And at the same time, I start crying. This was the first time that I figured out what means to be different. The story I'm going to tell you today is about this guy whom I saw some 10 years ago on TV. But before you telling you what was so unique about this person, just a small historical notice. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century, some one and a half million Armenians were slaughtered in Ottoman Empire and the shadow of this terrific event covers any positive perspective of turkish armenian relations. You know, there is a political struggle between the countries and then the state propaganda that tells us since our childhood, the schools, the media, the Turks are our enemies, and the same is happening in Turkey. And it seems that no one will and can ever challenge this. But this guy whom I saw on TV, he did so. He challenged perceptions and it was somewhat shattering for me. He said, I challenge the accepted version of history because I do not write about things in black and white. People here are used to black and white. That's why they are astonished that there are other shades too. And yes, I was astonished because I was told something different from what I've been told all my childhood. I was told that Turkey is not my enemy. And this person was Hrant Dink, a famous Armenian journalist who was living in Istanbul, Turkey, he published their um, Armenian newspaper, and then I learned that he had quite brave ideas about Turkish-Armenian reconciliation. He, uh, he saw his role in this process as an Armenian born in Turkey, and considering himself as a part of Turkish society, he was proud by both of his identities. He believed that the change should come not through politics, but through a change in societies, through a dialogue between societies, which was almost non-existent and moreover through democratic, democratic societies which would be able to acknowledge the past, face the challenges of present, <coughs> and build the future together. I was inspired by Hiram. Millions of women worldwide live in conditions in which they deprive of their basic human rights for no other reason than their gender. Discrimination and violence against women is commonplace and tolerated if not explicitly promoted. In the societies where legal codes protect women against their oppression and abuse, traditional practices and societal attitudes persist that place women in a subordinate position. Women face harassment on their choice of clothes and religious affiliation as well, which I constantly came across growing up in my youth in Tajikistan. I was tired of always being cautious of what I wear and how I walk and the way I communicate with men. I struggled to find a way of being invisible or rather not catching negative attention. It wasn't my clothes that provoked men and I had to cover myself to feel invisible, to feel, to feel secure. I didn't believe that wearing a veil would bring me freedom and question why do I need to be concerned with provoking, provoking negative attentions. 
Ah, how? How they can be proud of being Roma and Muslim? Why my parents cannot see that it's so bad to be Roma and Muslim in this society? I cannot hold this anymore. I cannot hear the sentence, the smelly gypsy Muslim girl. I hate the Roma population. I hate them for having black skin and for me being connected with them. The West does not accept me because I'm Muslim and the Roma sees me as the problem. The Europe sees me as the problem. I have to do something, something that will not bring me any problems related with my ethnicity, race, and religion. That means get rid of them, hide from them, Sebi, and don't tell anyone publicly that you're a gypsy girl, as they call you. Ah, okay, maybe if I do this, maybe if I hide my identity, I'm gonna have a better chance chances, I'm gonna have a better education, I'm gonna have a better chances for employment, and I will have much, much back, uh, access everywhere. I will not tell anyone that I'm a Romani Muslim woman, as they call me. I'm involved in <coughs> LGBT activism since 2011. That year I moved to Ireland, and I worked there for nine months as a volunteer. So far, this is the most beautiful period of my life. When I moved home, I joined the feminist and LGBT groups immediately. My dream was to become the founder of the LGBT History Month Hungary, and I became one of them, so things were amazing for a year. On the 2nd of July, 2030, things just changed. It was a shiny, warm day, I remember, and I just walked home from a Friday event. I checked my emails. I got a message from an other activist, and it was just a line, and it said, we are on the same list. The message contained a link as well. I just took at the link, and I had these misgivings, and I opened it, and it was an extremist website. I saw an article entitled The Big Faggot Database Number Two. I scrolled down the article without reading. I realized the photos, the names, and the Facebook pages of my colleagues and friends. I found this picture in the middle of the list. You know what happened? The unknown editors of this website put together a list. A list of those people who who online supported the programs of the Budapest Pride. They wished pleasant surfing for everybody. They encouraged their readers to give these people out. When I grow up, I want to be white, like Peter and Jesus, <laughs> to have no problems, and to be pure and standard, and culture, you know? I want to have culture and human rights, and I want to share my human rights with everybody. And with the rest of the world who got new rights and who want to be white. I want to expand culture to the world. Through music and force, through violins and guns. But first I want to play the violin. Oh, that's beautiful as white itself. Oh, oh yes, you hear? So, so pure. So rich, <laughs> so elegant. I want to be just like that. Standard beauty, standard English, standard shit, standard everything. That's <laughs> not <laughs> They should have imagined Philip is violent as a black man must be. But then they notice that instead of violence, his God is violent. Fragile instruments, so much European, so sophisticated. Then they thought, fine, he's black. Certainly plays jazz. <laughs> Although he also plays Mozart, you see how similar Paul Robson and my father sing Old Man River look like two deep voiced eyed free men sing Old Man River 
Two wise broad rivers whisper stories. The Danube and the Mississippi. You see that the skin of my father is kind of darker. I mean dark to be white. Is it just the old picture? Or was there a gypsy in your family? <coughs> That's so gay. What? My walk, my laugh, my shoes? <coughs> They're so gay. My shoes are gay. My nice red shoes have a gender and they feel sexual attraction towards other shoes of the same gender. <laughs> really? They are so gay. <laughs> the idea of gay shoes might sound ridiculous, but it might also sound kind of familiar. A Stonewall study of pupils in the UK found that 99% of school pupils hear homophobic comments at school. There must be a lot of gay shoes. But I don't need statistics to remind me of the oppressive, uncomfortable feeling and my own silence when my, my classmates would throw the word gay around at school. A teacher, a man who is gay, recently told me that his students guess his sexual orientation quickly, easily, because he's the only person in the school who picks up and questions homophobic language there. That's so sad. It's sad. Yeah, it's sad that we don't all, at, at all times, call, call each other out. The same teacher, though, also told me that his 10-year-old son came home from school one day to tell him that another boy had had a crush on him. His son liked the boy, but actually he wasn't ready for a relationship. <laughs> now, I hope that 10-year-old boy grows up with shoes that aren't gay, but are just shoes. And he can wear them how and where he wants, and he can use them to stamp out hatred. <clears throat> now, let me tell you of being in between, of questions like, what are you, or how are you not me, like me, not British? Let me begin by explaining that I am British. I was born in Luton and raised in Ipswich in the UK. Growing up, I've never lived anywhere else. I have a British passport, a British accent, but my name isn't British. Neither is my hair, my nose, or my parents. My skin, I suppose, is British enough. It wasn't until I got to sixth form and later to university that I began to realize that as British as I felt on the inside, on how I claim Britishness as my identity, that I didn't project it. I've had the question phrased in so many ways, it's difficult to remember. Where are you from, they ask. I'm British, I tell them. Yeah, but where are you from? <laughs> Ipswich, I reply, trying to guess what they want, where my home is, where I was born, where my parents are from. The most poorly phrased, out of them all, has to be the boy that asked me, yeah, but what's in you? <laughs> in the end, despite the many, many variations, all they want me to admit, to confess, is my difference. What are you? How are you not British? Not like me. I accept that this is curiosity, but it's loaded, politically and otherwise. A polite tone and intent cannot distract from the constant headlines which explicitly state that we do not want you. Why are you here? And go back where you came from. Despite my passing in the street, unlike others without fair enough skin at first glance, these questions serve as a mechanism to insist, to remind me that I am the daughter of immigrants, those who do not belong. My dad, who is Egyptian, who's lived in Britain for well over 20 years, uses such questions as an opportunity. When people ask, which they always do, and usually before a minute of conversation passes, he tells them he's Chinese, refusing their expectations. <laughs> <laughs> usually by a person, person's 20s, they have a pretty solid idea of who they are and what the key parts of their identity might be. Now, I totally qualify as one of those people, or at least I thought I did until I went to Israel last summer. And no, just because I'm Jewish, I still don't have a developed opinion on the happenings of the state of Israel. <laughs> but a weird thing did happen to me when I was there. I realized, as I mentioned before, 
that I have never really understood what being Jewish meant to me and to my identity. I've always defined my Jewishness, if you will, in relation to those around me. Amongst my very conservative friends, I wasn't even a Jew. I could barely call myself a Jew. But amongst my family members, who were pretty non-observant, I was one of the more religious ones, except for my grandma, who is pictured here in her younger years in a locket that I wear around my neck every day, who always, when she comes to visit us, asks my dad if he will light the candles for Shabbat but never succeeds. So when I went to Israel, for some reason, the focus shifted from my Jewishness in relation to those around me, to my dad, my sisters, my friends, my grandma, and so on, and suddenly became about my Jewish identity and what being Jewish meant to me. Grandma Roz was so proud. It's high time. What do you mean it's not the right time? When is the right time? Children are never on time. It doesn't mean we have to abandon an idea of having them. You have to have at least two babies by the time you turn 30. Only until 30 can you give birth to a healthy baby. If you won't give birth to a baby, no one will need you. It is now that you are having these views. You will want to get pregnant later, but it will be too late. It's now that you're having this opinion. It will change later. When I was your age, I already had children. When will you have them? All of your cousins already have children. When will you have them? Get pregnant as early as possible. The earlier you do this, easier it is to get back to shape. You will want the baby. <laughs> and you will have a sick baby. You will want the baby later and won't be able to get pregnant. You are 27. Hurry up. All men are taken. But maybe you can find a divorced one or widower who would marry you. <laughs> After 30, no one will look at you. You will die alone. <laughs> you are young and simply don't understand life. Everybody has children. You always want to be different, just for the sake of it. Look at you, want to spend all your life alone. You're just an egoist, wanting to live a life for yourself. You are a soulless human being if you don't want to have a baby. Look how cute they are. A <laughs> few weeks after, after my, mom, my mom convinced me to go back to school, I went back there. So I was running late and I forgot to brush my hair. And I said maybe it's a good idea if I take my brush with me at school and brush my hair before the class. So I went in the classroom and the teacher was not there, so I said I can brush my hair here. And this same kid, he just approached me and he asked me, why are you brushing your hair? And I just answered, I know how to care about myself, so shut up. <laughs> At the same moment, this kid came, took my brush, and he started throwing it around the classroom, and all the kids started to play with it. And one kid opened his bag, and he wanted to put it in his bag, the same brush. And I just said, I started shouting, that's my brush, that's my brush, give it to me back. And that in that moment, the teacher came in the classroom. She just saw the whole situation and she said to me, come on, you're a Roma, you don't brush your hair. Three years later, I heard that Ram Dink was murdered by a 17-year-old nationalist Turkish boy. <coughs> and I saw his bleeding body on TV and I was shocked <coughs> that he was a victim of hate crime. Um, I knew that we had bad relations, but I would have never expected that we can still kill each other because of our nationality. I was full of anger. I was full of hate. Ferenc's life in Turkey as a representative of Armenian minority was never easy. He was convicted for his articles. He received numerous death threats, and he was urged to leave the country. And when he was asked about the pressure on him, he said that he is like a pigeon in this society who needs to be careful. Every time he moves his head side to side, looks around as fast as possible in order to avoid danger. But he said he was not scared because he knew that no one shoots pigeons in this society. He was mistaken. They shot the pigeon. They killed Hiram. And you know why exactly what, uh, he was murdered? Uh, Hiram published an article about uh, the daughter of the Turkish first president and claimed that the girl was Armenian. 
and many Turkish found it insulting for them, and being named Armenian was insulting for them. Uh, and, uh, uh, the reaction was outrageous, and the, uh, could found that he was declared an enemy, a uh, traitor, a fascist who is even worse than Hitler, and expel him, look at that Armenian, Grand scratches. These are just few examples of uh, headlines of newspapers that you could find at that day. <coughs> you may say these are just words, but these are not. These are more than just words. These are these are hate words. And the boy uh, who was asked why he killed Rand, he said, <coughs> because I learned from newspapers that Rand is a traitor. The hate speech published in media turned into a hate crime in reality. But then what happened? Uh, on the day of his funeral was unbelievable. Tens of thousands of Turks were out to streets paying tribute to Grant. They challenged perceptions. They said no to hate. They carried posters written, I am Grant, we are all Grant, we are all Armenians. They refused to hate. Hate is not the answer, but solidarity is. And this answer was given by Grant. And the change was made by his death. And I saw these people. I saw the change. And something in me changed as well. Oh, at least uh, these people are not the murderers. These people are not my enemies. These are the people whom I can address my speech. And these are the people who I'm, who I'm ready to listen to. These are the people whom, with whom I can start a dialogue. A dialogue, the beginning of which was put by Han Ding, who sacrificed his life for that. In a family surrounded by strong women, I was taught a different lesson. Compared to my, some of my classmates, who eagerly consider marriage as their sole purpose in life. My mother, my hero, taught me to be strong and stand for my beliefs, against any tradition and beliefs that, that left me vulnerable. But as strong as my family supported the independence of women, the picture outside my home was very different. I was insecure because certain attitudes affected my confidence. Not many of you would know how it feels to walk in the crowded areas such as markets or during daytime and be constantly anxious that someone is going to touch your back like you're a piece of meat and shout out, Jigarta Bukholom, which means I will eat your liver as supposed to be a compliment. My mother found her way of fighting it against men's attitude by shaming of their acts and slogans to women as inferior in demand of hate speech to place them in the right spot. But do other women follow her brave steps? Do they shame those men with the cause of social humiliation of being touched? Mostly no, because this woman might be seen as they provoke men and it's their fault. I was tired of such experiences that make you wish you were born in a different society. Look at me after 10 years. I have graduated from college, I've built a career, I'm white, Christians, just like my friend. On the superficial, I'm living good. Well, actually, I'm living the white dream. But the, the reality is that I'm still the Romani Muslim woman. And that means living a different kind of reality. It means going about a day in fear of being found out. It means painfully doing things I know are wrong. Never attending anything re related with Roma. Never talking about my own culture and tradition. Forgetting my own language. Just being someone else and not the real me. One of my friends told me that the list was expectable. And because of my activities, it is not surprising to see my photo on this list. The school attitude was so hurtful for me and, and made me ask, was it really expectable? Well, you know, during the last couple of years, there is a lot of trouble around Budapest Pride. The parade is protected by cordons, police, and verbal and physical abuses are regular during or after the pride. At 2012, the names and the photos of the Eurogames organizers was published. Just before the first LGBT History Month Hungary, an extremist site reported about the program series and said the WLC Games faced in Hungary again. So somehow, maybe, maybe this list was expectable, but it still not means we deserve this kind of coldness to be told it was expectable. 
the editors of the website promised that they won't let the faggots celebrate this disgusting thing peacefully. But surprisingly, and luckily, people were really supportive. They sent supportive messages, and they even asked the editors to put their names on the list as well. More than 8,000 people came to the Pride Parade. It was so unbelievable. But what the fuck? You got all these folks in white skin looking like garbage cans, walking around Budapest collecting garbage and shit, and all my life I've been told you act mad white, as though it's a bad thing collecting garbage and shit. Poor white man trying to preserve his health, taking up space with no disgrace before it's too late, trying to make sense of all this mess that is the state of things. Is he white if white is pure? Can she be white if, she, if she's this poor? His shirt with holes, his holes show souls of the feet that have no soul, a criminal for being poor. This is Budapest in EU, representing motherfuckers who I say fuck you, who reply fuck you too, just like race. It makes no sense, but that's okay. I'm not here for hate. This is for my resume. No time to bullshit. Collect <laughs> all this shit that'll make me shine in the future with as little effort as possible. Such is the stereotype of the nigger. I hate school. I'm so far so good and I hate school. And here I have a full fellowship. Someone serious could have had it. Too late, I'm a nigger. I'm a thief collecting opportunities. <laughs> Four ropes on it. My father sing old man river. Think about skin color. Why my great grandmother dealing with the shape of her Jewish nose. Are we free to change the color of our skin? Are we free to paint over part of our nose? You can baptize the day before your marriage as my great grandmother did. Aren't you still Jewish? You can be the first girl who graduated from high school in your town as my great grandmother did. Aren't you still woman? Here you can see the sister of my great grandmother and her husband. They were shot to the Danube in January 1945. What would they say if they heard? that the current chairman of the Hungarian parliament, Laszlo Kovér, the guy on the right side of this picture, I'm sitting in the middle behind me, is the current prime minister, said in fall 1990, when cab drivers blocked bridges over a broad river, that they should be shot to the Danube. Paul Robson and my father, were singing about human rights. History got into the deep voiced eyes of these two free men, sing All Men River in English and in Hungarian. Paul got blacklisted in the McCarthy era. Wait, how is it when a black man gets blacklisted? <laughs> The black man has always been blacklisted. Lajos, <laughs> <laughs> my father, was born at two places. You might ask, how is that possible? Two places is the name of his small village of birth. He was born to a six children Catholic family and often said as I grew up, I'm not the servant of anyone. The wardrobe. Today I wish to hang my skin at a kotuk. A kotuk functions as a temporary comfort for those who suffer under unnecessary load. Seem convincing to be freed for a moment from the burden of fuddy hair, scars and worn grain. To disrobe from everything which would bear witness of a fragile female body 
wrapped into casual fabrics, hiding under layers of artificial color and bundles of hair. But then I started to ponder, for how long <laughs> should it be decent to wander around by one's bare flesh and bones? What should be the length of a moment taken off in order to take a rest from the load, which was not been chosen by me, but which was put into my shoulders by the limbs of those nameless whose touch has been from the start scratching, rasping and burning their skin. Today I wish to unskin myself. Yet another skin I do not want, nor will I be given a new one. Would you think it's fate be any better? <coughs> And finally, let me tell you of being my father's wife. Now, I hope that statement horrifies you, as it does me. <laughs> People tell me I look like my mum all the time, but never that I look like my dad. I never really realised this until recently, when our relation to one another began to be called into question. One day, around a year ago, on a trip into town with my dad, a day that he took off from work for some father's daughter time, he began talking with a man about switching cable services. When me and my dad walk together, I hold his arm. We're close, obviously so, and when I think of it, our affection is clearly on display. After talking for some time and being undecided, the man talking to my father remarks, why don't you go and talk it over with your wife, gesturing to me. This question hit me hard. A mixture of shock and disgust at, the, uh, disgust at the ins his insinuation. I glared at him as my dad took to explain that I'm his daughter, not his wife. A few days before coming to Budapest, it happened again. In town with my dad, we went to the bank and waiting for someone to tend to us, after giving the bank my details, which specifies that I am a miss and not a missus. A clerk beckons to us to follow with the words, please come this way, Mr. and Mrs. Hussain. Again, why on earth do they think I'm his wife? Not only in England, but in Egypt as well, I've become so very conscious of such mistakes. When walking with my dad, male cousins and uncles, I'm never a family member. I've been the wife, the girlfriend, the foreigner in need of a tour guide or a translator. I've always questioned why this is so, and finally I figured it out. These misinterpretations of our relationship these errors and mistakes are based on one thing that marks our difference and never our similarity. And let me tell you, I look far more like my father than my Irish mother, simply is that we do not share the same skin colour. So getting back to the comment that I started this monologue with, and I apologise for my rather long tangent. My exposure to so-called hate speech started somewhat seems somewhat delayed in comparison to my friends and classmates. I heard this comment actually here in Hungary about a month ago from a fellow student at CEU. I may have been exposed to hurtful speech or hate speech in the past and maybe even towards Jewish people, but it never affected me like this has, probably because of my recent trip to Israel, which I spoke about earlier. So I'm going to repeat. Jews only marrying other Jews is no different than Nazis attempting to create a racially homogeneous Aryan world. So I, a person who doesn't even subscribe to this aspect of Judaism, respond, I'm sorry, can you clarify? Now I will try and sum up the rest of this conversation. And I quote, Jews only want to marry other Jews, right? Other people have watched their cultures die out before. What makes the Jews different? Protecting their own heritage by only marrying other Jews is a means of perpetuating the Jewish race. So don't you think that Jews marrying other Jews is kind of like Nazis attempting to create a dominant Aryan race during World War II? Again, see the photo of my married great grandparents my grandma, who has family, who were killed in the Holocaust. So no, actually, I don't think that. 
In the end, this comment, as confusing and troubling as it was to me, actually made me more curious about Judaism and about my culture. It not only caused me to do more thinking about Jewish traditions, but actually, in a way, enhanced my feelings of connection to this part of my identity. So I guess what I should be saying is thank you for calling the Jews Nazis. <laughs> Women usually say they don't want to have children when no one is offering them to get married and have some. <laughs> you are irresponsible. You are afraid of responsibility. And who you are at this age? What are you? No family, no children. You are sick. It's not normal. You're not a woman. What does it mean you don't want to have children? Every woman wants to have children. You need to visit a psychiatrist. <laughs> <laughs> If a woman doesn't want children, she is mentally sick. A woman has to be a mother. You're not a woman if you don't want to have babies. If a woman was never married, there must be something wrong with her. A woman who doesn't want to have a baby is biological garbage. <laughs> <laughs> you have to give birth to at least one child. It's egoistic to live for yourself only. This is your duty. What does it mean you don't want to? You have to. What if everyone will, will think like you? Then no one will have babies. Mm -hmm. Get pregnant and give a birth. We will take care of the rest. <laughs> <laughs> All my friends are grandmothers. Only I still don't have grandchildren. You can't keep marriage, but you're obliged to provide me with a granddaughter. <laughs> don't you want to cheer me up with grandchildren? <laughs> Не сиди на камне, тебе еще рожать. I started in high school, and I was trying my best. I was doing everything to make my mother proud of me. I was representing the school on many competitions, leaving good impression. It was my shining time. But even during that time, I've heard many comments related to the sentence, what if she's the best student? She's still a gypsy without parent. I was not the small, weak girl anymore. But actually, once again, I start crying. Now, not because of words, but understanding how cruel the world can be. Seven years passed, and I got accepted to CEU, which meant not only studying opportunities, but also um, a chance to be involved in multicultural environment. And I truly understood it, the, the intercultural festival that we had some two months ago. That day, I met a Turkish girl. Her name is Ebru, and by the way, she's here. And we had a small conversation. And uh, we talked about our life at CU and easily turned to Armenian-Turkish relations. Um, I was really amazed by her knowledge about Armenian culture and history, and I was thinking by myself, what about me? Do I really know this much about Turkey? I realized how, how much this is necessary for the dialogue. Anyway, we felt so easy in our conversation, and so we felt no any burden in front of us. Even Ebru told me that if she had a boy, she would name her Aram, which is an Armenian name. She's my brother's name, and it was really nice. And I thought that they, even this dialogue, the one that Randing was talking about, even the this small conversation between us, a part of a bigger societal dialogue, a crucial part of this dialogue. And how many conversations are going on now? This is what really matters, and this is what will lead to a change. The change that was dreamed by Helen dream, and it was made true by us. Russia, 
or just another stand that never comes on news and rather perceived peaceful. Well, it is peaceful compared to certain countries that are constantly in war, but how much so? In a state where 90% of people are Muslim might indicate a commonly shared ideology and dismiss the separation within, within one religion, dismiss the difference that caused a civil war and erupted so many lives. Growing up, I experienced less harassment than the member of the minority group that I belonged to. Maybe of my facial features and a lack of accent that I wasn't mocked of not being to cor not, of not being able to correctly pronounce certain words or not looking like a dominant group. But it didn't mean that I haven't experienced such irritation. In the middle school and high school years, some of my friend, some of some of the incidents that I came across nudged me that my beliefs were not true Islamic and my practices were not in accordance with the practice of the dominant culture, which made them less legitimate and more of the other. What was the worst? I hated my own people. I was blaming them for me being discriminated and hated. Just because I wanted a, a different, a normal life, a life without any discrimination, racism, and hate speech. Yes, I admit, it was easier for me to be part of the system instead of fighting against the system. Does this make me selfish? Was this the only way I could have? better life? To whom should I say sorry? Or should society tell me sorry for being such? Despite every solidarity and support I have <coughs> in years, what if my neighbors were extreme? Just few days after the list appeared, my ex-classmate from the college published a homophobic article. I was worried about my friends too. The most important thing, I didn't want to let my mother to see the list because this shameful contest would hurt for her and I didn't want to let her to worry about me constantly. I don't think the supportive comments would just confront me. So as the reaction shows, times might change, but we still have to think about the dangers. We should never forget about the possible consequences of listing people on the basis of their religion, ethnicity, or orientation. This list is not just threatening for those who are on the list, who just basically support in the Budapest Pride one. Ah, <laughs> why the fuck would I want to be white if I have to keep up with a nigger? who plays the violin and shakes hands with Tony Bennett. You're a faggot, but I'm a nigga. Who performed on stage <coughs> at Carnegie Hall at age 11 on the violin. They gave him hate, reason for violence. He fucked them up with a violin and now they hate him because now they're 25 and all they can do is chat on Facebook and sleep late. They talk behind his back because he's a leader. And if he hears them, they'll delete him and they'll be lost because he's the light. Not because he's white, but because he shines. <laughs> My father died six years before Shiny 1989. He did not hear when one of her sisters at the family Christmas in 1990 <coughs> objected to voting for a liberal party saying, but those are the Jews. So it was not such a big use when in 2009 in New York an anti-Semitic and anti-Hungarian immigrant asked me about how much Jewish blood I have and my Jewish Hungarian great-grandmother decided to show up there a racist fellow Hungarian told me there you are like Barack Obama <laughs> I was more surprised when I heard in a party of a dance choreographer in a liberal group of people also in Manhattan about Obama that he has white values. <laughs> so who's white? And who's black? Am I getting crazy about this? Speaking through my homeless looking bear? Or you also see how similar Paul Robson and my father look like two deep voiced eye free men Sing Old Man River for human rights. 
think about the skin color at the Mississippi where niggers in these lines of the song niggers all work on the Mississippi niggers all work while the white folks play was first changed to darkies then to colored folks then to the old Paul Robson and my father two deep voice die three men sing old man river sing about freedom to love at the Danube where a non Roma girl may not tell her parents if she's got a Roma boyfriend as her parents would not tolerate that Paul Robson and Lyle Schmolnar two deep voice died three men singing old man river their voices join forces and I get not the facts but the truth the simple truth that they have been brothers if race, ethnicity, nationality no longer matters then why can't I be my father's daughter? why can't I be British? must I be a terrorist? again Thank you for calling the Jews Nazis. <laughs> Motherhood is a choice and not an imperative. What defines normality? My skin color, my family status, or my origin? So how many conversations are going on now that will, that will lead to a change? Despite all the differences, we need to unite in solidarity and, and hate speech. Vivian Redding said, Roma are the problems. Would you all agree with her? Within a system that accepts hate speech and hate list, everybody is just a potential victim. And if race matters, am I a white nigger? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you also see how similar Paul Robson and my father look like? <laughs> <laughs> Can we be brave and call each other out? Every woman is worth defending. Every woman matters. 